This is the first steps for how a major university indoctrinates their students into a Marxist, communist, atheist mindset and understanding of the world. So this is a general psychology textbook that I took in the fall of 2002 when I attended uh, my first college. I'm not going to mention them here, but you can look it up. Very easy to find. This was the general psychology textbook. Now let me show you how they indoctrinate you to think like an atheist and a Marxist. So if you open up to page five right away, they talk about the definition of psychology. They talk about uh, psychology, the study of the mind and the soul. But in the 1900s, psychologists define the field as a study of behavior. Behavior is clearly observable and suitable to scientific study. So right away, they're not really giving much of a background there. They're, going, they're jumping right to the 20th century. Then what they do, the next thing, is they show an optical illusion. And this is common in psychology. They show you optical illusions. Why? To show you you cannot trust your senses. Now, I get it. Our senses, aren't, our, senses our mind, it's not perfect, but it is useful. But they get you doubting your, yourself right away. So, you know, maybe I don't know. Ever, maybe, maybe I should doubt my common sense. Now, I get it. There are counterintuitive principles out there, but we should start with what we know and things that we are sure of. We should start with first principles. We shouldn't start with doubting ourselves. It's a very dangerous foundation to build out. And then it says underneath, for a compromise, let's define psychology as the systematic study of behavior and experience. Um, I don't want to compromise right away. What is psychology? For the sake of, of, this is their definition in a college textbook at a major university. For the sake of compromise, let's define psychology as the systematic study of behavior and experience. You know, that's, that's again, not very, not very solid ground to start on. But once you start on that ground, now your mind is thinking about that. So then it goes on to the next page, page six and seven. They're talking about free will versus determinism. Now, we know free will is the traditional teachings. It is the Catholic teachings. It's the, the realist realism in the world um, versus determinism. Everything, everything is, you know, it's, it's all completely cause and effect, no outs, you know, it's, it's not on the individual at all. Like the person, the person doesn't have free will. And it says basically gives a case for free will, small case for free will, small case for determinism. And it says at the end that the, the, the final word on free will versus determinism is the assumption. Let's note an important point here. The assumption that behaviors have observable causes seems to work, and anyone planning to do research on behavior is almost forced to start with this assumption. It's merely an assumption, not certainty. So they're saying it's not certain, but the book is telling you where they're leaning. They're leaning towards determinism against free will. That's a break from traditional teachings. Okay, they just kind of pepper it in there and they say it's not certain, but now they're going to build out the whole book based on that assumption. Remember, if the assumptions are wrong, the, the entire tree collapses. The enti the, if the foundation is wrong, the, the entire um, building collapses. And right away, we have a shaky definition of psychology, right? Let's just say for the sake of compromise, this is psychology. And now we're going to assume behaviorism. Let's see what else we do. We're only on page seven now. Then we go through... Then they finally start talking about tradition, at least a little bit. They touch on it, but watch how they do it. We're on page 17, chapter 2. Psychology then and now. The early era, at least since Aristotle, philosophers, at least since Aristotle, philosophers and fiction writers have debated, debated why people act the way they do. You're going to group Aristotle in with fiction writers in the same sentence? You've got to be kidding me. Aristotle was not some flash in the pan, uh, the, um, you know, scientist or philosopher. This was the uh, Aristotle's um, theories of personality. I mean, they still hold true. St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, the great doctor of the church, he endorses uh, Aristotle he holds him in the, in the absolute highest regard as far as the natural, as far as natural intelligence, natural reason. Okay, and for them in this book to to mention Aristotle, he was around three hundred years before Christ. So from three hundred BC until nineteen ten, where they're going to start, that was at all Aristotle. Aristotle wasn't like a flash in the pan for five years. So to just set him aside with Aristotle philosophers and fiction writers and just cram them all together. That's, that's not fair to do. 
That's not doing the learner, that's not giving the student a proper justice of the material. Even if they disagreed with Aristotle, you don't present him like that. That makes no sense. So they say since Aristotle philosophers and fiction writers have debated why people act the way they do, why they have experiences, and why one person is different from another, without, discount, without discounting the importance of these great thinkers, several 19th century scholars whether, wondered whether a scientific approach would be fruitful. So you see, they set him aside without taking anything away from Aristotle. And then what do they do? They take away from him. And then they build Wilhelm Wundt, the first psychological laboratory. The origin of psychology as we know it is generally dated to 1879. Again, you got to be kidding me here. This is the, the, the Catholic Church has talked about the temperaments. The, again, it's, it's in Aristotle, it's in Aquinas, going back to Aristotle, to not talk about the four temperaments, the choleric, the sanguine, the uh, melancholic, the phlegmatic. It's doing a disservice to the field. It's, they've spoken about the de anima, so, um, Aristotle's book on the soul. His, um, yeah, his, his treatment on the soul. And St. Thomas Aquinas' his commentary on it. You could buy it on Amazon. I have it in the back right here. Where De Anima, On the Soul, and St. Thomas Aquinas' commentary. So when you say psych the study of psychology started in 1879, <laughs> save that for someone else. Because it's not true. People were studying the soul for a while. The next page, 18 and 19, they have a timeline of psychology. Where do you think the timeline starts? 300 years before Christ with Aristotle? Nope. Starts with Arab philosopher in the year 1000. Then we see discovery of color blindness in the 1600s. And then we see in the 1649, Rene Descartes, who we knew drew the Cartesian divide, the split of the, of the mind and body, the body and the soul. So that's starting with a bad character. Then 1740s, we see uh, David Hume. We see Wundt, who was just brought up in 1879. William James, behaviorist, 1892, again, not, you know, not, um, not Aristotelian, Freud in 1900, and then all, and then that's, that's right there, and then the whole page is everything that's happened in the 20th century, so nothing about Aristotle, when his, his understanding of psychology was the primary thought, nothing about him, okay, so that's, that, that's what you see right there, then as we go through the book, What's the next thing they do? Page 21, they do the first thing all atheistic and Marxist nations do. The first thing they teach is not atheism, it's evolution. Look at all communist countries. The first thing they teach is evolution because you need to get people to believe they're not important. You have to deny the creation narrative of Genesis, which is a fact, which we do believe. And you now, you now start with a new narrative of, of, of what it means to be a person. So evolution, that's all built into there. And right away, that's what they do. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. So now remember, they already have a shaky foundation. Now we're going to add to that shaky foundation evolutionary theory, which is going to underlie everything that's in these next few, these, this entire book. Okay, so they're, they're setting it up. This is where they're coming from. It's not traditional thinking. It's anti-traditional thinking at every single turn. I don't want to say every single turn because it's not that there's not good information in this book. There is a lot of very good information in this book about human behavior. But what they're doing is they're divorcing it from the proper context, from the traditional Catholic understanding of the world. So now we're on page 31. We're on chapter... Three. What's well, this? 2.1 here. So the, the first one must have been an introduction. Chapter, chapter, chapter two, the third section we have of this book. Now what do they do? The entire chapter is all dedicated to the scientific method. Now the scientific method started with uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And he broke, uh, th this was in I think the 15th century, the 16th century. He broke from traditional understanding of, of how to do logic and science. He broke, he broke from that there. Now, again, science is great. Aristotle had a, has a lot on science. The difficulty, the difficulty is the problem is there's an elevation of science nowadays. There's scientism. They're holding the scientific method as the holy grail of, in, of intelligence, of logic, of reason, which it's not. Okay, philosophy always has the last word. Philosophy is the father of any science. Philosophy has the last word. So an overemphasis of science. They're always going to do that. Remember, they're just setting the frame. We're only on chapter two. We haven't learned anything about psychology. And look what they've already done. 
And then when I skip ahead to chapter four, the next thing they start talking about is interpretation of sensory information. And now we're talking about, again, not really being able to trust your senses. They're not dependable. Aristotle did the exact opposite. He says, what can we know? Let's start with what we know. Let's start with first principles. You know, the principle of non-contradiction. A thing cannot both be and not be in the same respect at the same time. That's what he started with Aristotle. He started with what we know. That's what the church is built on. What we got, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pull the plug on it right there. That's only four chapters into the book before they really go into the, the guts of psychology and learning about people. This is how they're teeing it up. They're setting aside Aristotle. Psychology begins in 1879. We can't trust our senses. We have shaky assumptions, a, a very soft definition, invented definition, you could say. You have uh, a nod to determinism, which is going to be a, an, an underlying assumption. You have setting aside Aristotle along with grouping him in with fictional writers. And we have an elevation of evolution and the scientific method. Again, the scientific method, a lot of people don't realize it. That was in Francis Bacon's, what he called nov novum organum, the new organon. So what was the old organon? The old, the old organon, the old way of understanding information was Aristotle. So it's a massive break from the traditional understanding of information. Again, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, these aren't flash in the pan people. These are smartest people of all time. And this is how they tee up the book from this lens. This major university wants us to understand the person and how we think. Now think about the implications of that. You have the, so some of these people might eventually go on to be psychologists. They might go on to be teachers, whatever their procession, their understanding of a human person and the human mind is set up early in this book through this lens, determinism, evolution, an, elevate, an overemphasis on the scientific method, a setting aside of Aristotle and the classics, not being able to trust your senses, a very shaky sense, you can't trust your senses. Is that really the education that you really want to pay for? What's the answer? You know, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. You might, need, you might need a degree if you want to be in a certain field, but... The point is, as far well, we know the answer. The answer is, is Our Lady of Fatima, Roman Catholic SOS. Pray the rosary every day, consecrate yourself to Mary, wear the brown scapular, offer up your sufferings, and uh, finally, um, Saturday, S, last, uh, first Saturdays of every month. So we know that's the answer, but as far as a natural level, uh, what, do, what, do, what do we do with, the, with this education? I mean, you have to learn Aristotle. You have to go back. You want to understand the person? You're better off starting with De Anima which is Aristotle, and look at his commentaries by St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, then, if you flipped later into the book and you learned some information, there's going to be some gold nuggets that you gain from it. It's not like the book is completely bad, but it sets you up to think in a very dangerous way and a very anti-Catholic way. Just want you to be aware of it. Take care. God bless you and your family.